aussi. Je sais pas. Quoi Qui est là euh, Oui, Sorry, je suis là. Nous sommes lucky, nous sommes arrivés dans les années 80. Oui, je pense que l'Amérique a changé. Vous étiez en charge de cette révolution Non, non, non. Non, non, mais oui, les années 80, absolument, nous étions tous des sort of étudiants de la nouvelle cuisine en France. And we came here and say, well, it's time to change everything. New York in the 80s, I really feel the food scene was amazing. They were the beginning of a divide between the past generation of chefs and this young chef like me, like Jean Georges, who came and started to transform into a, a new vision for the culinary landscape. I mean, I met Daniel uh, when I arrived in New York. Uh, I was in Boston in 85. I arrived in New York in July 86. You, you lived for a while uh, on 67. I lived on 66. So we, see each other once in a we while. could see yeah. each other from the window. <laughs> yes, yeah. I met you yeah. the first month. 30 years ago. Yeah, the first month. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Daniel is probably the first person uh, I talked to when I arrived in New York in 86. She was here a couple of years before me, so we became friends immediately. On, uh, He gave me some tips where to buy things, how to go around New York. I'm a country boy in the end. I was scared to take the subway, I was scared of, uh, you know, it's a big city. The next day I went to Chinatown. I was like, this is my town. I feel like in Hong Kong. I was like seven years in France, five years in Asia. The whole combination was, I thought it was perfect for the moment. Jean-Georges and, and Daniel inspired me a lot because when I was much younger, they were already known as chefs and I was not there yet. Uh, I was working as a sous chef. You, in 1986, I was here for 10 days, invited by Boulet. That's right. And then, when I was in uh, 1989 at Jean Louis at the Watergate, years, yeah. you came to, for, for dinner. That's right. All my life, I wanted to be the chef of a um, beautiful restaurant with a lot of cooks in a kitchen, doing amazing food and having great service, creating an experience that is very special to the client. And the dream came true. 91, I am in New York. It's June 10, 7.40 a.m. I'm walking the door of Le Bernardin. I look at my watch and I know I'm going to spend my life here. And then Jacques, when I came to Le Cirque, yeah, you were working with Daniel. In 1986, I was starting here at Le Cirque. I needed an amazing pastry chef. And I found Jack Torres, who was in Atlanta at the Ritz Carlton. Alain Ducasse came and I said, Alain, uh, I need a pastry chef, but I need to find a French guy here, in, maybe in America. And Alain Ducasse said, get out of Atlanta and come to New York to work for Daniel. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Oh, wow. I, because you know each other from Nice. I remember when I arrived, uh, I was maybe a little bit too classic and having a discussion with you, Daniel. Yeah. And you tell me, <laughs> say, be very playful, just play with I know, Jack, you were always. And, and then that was the beginning of, of the desserts, you know, a little bit crazy dessert that I was doing. So basically, yeah, 30 years of friendship. I think Daniel is a papa. Daniel is high energy. He's the godfather of uh, the new French cuisine in Europe. You know when he's in the kitchen, even if you don't see him, you can feel the energy in the air. Brrr. I would call him the Tasmanian devil. <laughs> And you never change. I mean, like, I'm always so impressed with you that you have a level of energy that is incredible. Now I pass the energy to my son, so. But you're the life of the, you're the, life of the party. About the high energy, I think about it. At 10 o'clock, I start to look at my watch. I'm like, oh my God, yes, you start. <laughs> Eric, you know, is a monk in the kitchen. Eric is Mr. Zen. Very spiritual. I think that Eric is the king of fish. This food is very pristine, clean. He's a minimalist in his cooking. I think it goes well with his character. Eric is the youngster, the last one who came on board the our club. Jean-Georges is JG. He's very Asian in his influence. He goes in a lot of places and he succeeds and he comes back and he keeps succeeding. I mean, he's unbelievable. When I think of Jean-Georges, I always think of like fresh ingredients cooked very quickly. Jean-Georges is, is the magician of putting all those cultures together. So Jacques, I will call him Willy Wonka. He's a chocolate master, great pastry chef. We call him the sweet man. He's a wizard. Jacques always thinks very playfully. All chocolates, all the time. 
everywhere. Tell us about this moment. This was here, Jacques Daniel. This yeah. was almost like close to, this, to where we are now. I started at Le Bernardin in 91. Ah, so it has to, it has to be 92. after 91 or 92. Okay. Yeah. Eric was so young. Oh, uh, I'm but you, were, you were already like super famous, the three of you. Yeah. Uh -huh. And I was the young kid in the blog. Jean-Georges influenced me uh, to create dish that are very straightforward with very pure flavors, very light. When he was the chef at Lafayette, he was doing a lot of juice with vegetables and they were replacing those heavy sauce. My technique was French, but then uh, my secret weapon were uh, Asian flavor. I was using French foie gras with uh, ginger mango. I was using lemongrass in some soups. I'm talking about 1986, so... I mean, blending it was revolutionary for me, but as well was uh, for the customer as well. So my food was very well received. And I think as well, the openness of the people's mind in New York was, you know, easier for us too. They were yeah, nice. oh, totally. Yes. Oh, totally yes, open sure. to try new things. Uh -huh. What kept us here is because we could do what we really wanted to do. Yeah, so. it's a big apple. It's a big apple. It's the big apple, yeah. And we all bite on it. <laughs> I think my first food memory was really my smell. My bedroom was right above the kitchen. I could smell, uh, you know, was, you know, if it's a roast chicken, or it was a uh, asparagus cooking, or some sauerkraut going on. I was born and raised on the farm, and to me, the kitchen was the most interesting part of the entire farm. <laughs> Basil, for me, it's something that brings me back to the streets uh, with grandma. The smell was so fragrant and so vivid. I still remember today the smell of the first dough coming out of the refrigerator when you turn that dough on your marble and you press it. This is a, a smell that I associate with early morning. I love this, this type of smell still today. I mean, me at home was always a, a one pot meal most of the time, you know. A roast to a, a, a stew, or... a stew, whatever it is, you know. Yeah. Couple of salads, but always family style. When I grew up, we're still three generations on the same roof. The grandparents were there, the parents, the kids, 18 people, 20 people for dinner. So it was like a mini restaurant at home. We used to do a stew, potato, leeks and lamb. But when you raise the chicken and when you roast that chicken in your home with all the vegetable you grow in your garden, it take an unforgettable dimension. I grew up in, in Bandol, and the neighbor was actually the fisherman who has his uh, cart on the market. So every day we had the fresh fish from the night. So that was great. And mom was cooking the fish relatively simply with potatoes in the oven. We know the people who grow the vegetable. We know the people who you know, make wine. I mean, every product had a name on it. So growing up like that, I definitely developed a love for the good product, the right product at the right season. We had appetizer main course, cheese dessert, on different china in between lunch and dinner. Oh, la, la. Different te tablecloth. Oh. Wow. That was unbelievable. I grew up in a wrong house. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. And I thought every kid was eating like that, you know. <laughs> so at a very young age, I had that kind of passion for the, uh, what we call in French, l'art de la table, which is sitting down at the table and having um, a meal in a proper china with nice silverware and so on. I really had to decide at 15 years old that I would go to the kitchen or to a culinary school at least. In France, um, it's when you have to choose if you're going to still go to high school and college or uh, go to a vocational uh, school. I was not the best students. Actually, I want to be a chef. I want to be a savory chef. That was a good pastry shop. So I was 15 when I walk in and ask the owner if, if I'm able to, to try. He said, look, if you come every Saturday, every Sunday, and you like it, I might take you as an apprentice. So for one year, I did that, and I completely love it. I fall in love with all that stickiness, the butter, the sugar, the, uh, something about it that I just fall in love. And I decide that that's what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. My father took over the business from his father. Being the older brother, I was destined to take over the business. So they sent me to an engineer school when I was 16. I hated every minute of it. For my 16th birthday, they took me to a three-star Michelin restaurant. It's the first time I went to a 
a fine dining restaurant on uh, the ballet of the waiters, the food and everything's like, this is it. Actually, I started cooking professionally at 14. Until 17, I did an apprenticeship. I was very lucky, always remain within that sort of level of restaurant, which was two star and three star Michelin. And so coming here after 10, 11 years of practice in France, I almost felt responsible to transmit what I've learned. It's a big advantage that we had a training like that, yeah. like classic training, we because to... we have an understanding when something goes wrong, we know, yeah. because you we know, know the basic. Yeah. Um, and of course, it's the base of the pyramid. Without that, we wouldn't be able to create whatever we create. It's been, become a great uh, community amongst us, and we all immigrants, and we all came on similar time. I mean, I, I took a lot, a lot of risk uh, as an immigrant because I say, you know, you take a little more risk, I think, when it's not your own, uh, where you were born. Naively, I thought I could come here without speaking English, and therefore I spoke only French. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I was lost. <laughs> Coming to America, we weren't immigrating because we needed to run away from our country. Uh, we, come, we were coming to be able to bring something with us. And we do appreciate to be here, certainly. I mean, I love, I love to be in the US. I love this country. I, I, I might teach and I might bring something, but I also um, love to be here. This is a place where I really love to be. For me, I think the biggest uh, challenge was uh, adjusting myself to uh, lunch service, you know, one hour for the lunch. Pace. The, pace uh, of, uh, the pace of New York was a little, uh, a bit much in the beginning for me, and then uh, I got used to it. Doing lunch and dinner, it's brutal. It took me a little while to adjust mm -hmm. to that. <laughs> I think the biggest obstacle for me was to change the habit of customer. Coming from Le Cirque, which was very classic, and jumping into my, uh, sort of my restaurant 25 years ago, that was kind of an obstacle to be able to jump and say, hey, this is what I want to do now. My fear was uh, not just the name, but financially. You know, I put my retirement money into, yeah. into a business and, and I went in and I remember to be really scared to hire my first employee. I came to, to America and I succeed in a restaurant and I make a name for myself working at Le Cirque. When I did that, and when I reached 40, this is when I say, you know what, I'm going to run a business. I don't think that I had all the knowledge to open a business, of course. I make a lot of mistakes, and, uh, and it worked. So I'm, in a way, very fortunate too. The biggest challenge for me in my career, probably was Gilbert Lecoz, uh, my, my mentor at Le Bernardin, who was the chef owner of Le Bernardin, passed away in 1994. I was 29. I was suddenly with a big team in the kitchen and I had to prove myself. I used to be um, a young chef with a temper. I was a screamer and I was abusive in the kitchen. I was losing the best employees in the, in the kitchen. When I grew up as a chef, uh, you kind of had the, the crush mentality where they crush you then here we make sure we lift. Today, my role is to um, mentor them, to be inspired, to be successful in their life. We want them to succeed and to be well prepared for their future. One of my manager, he came as a refugee from uh, Kosovo and he started as a boss boy. To us is the reward there. I think um, between the four of us, I think we know we... Oh, we have trained uh, we have a an army. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. We have sometimes like 20, 30 different nationalities represented in the crew of our staff. Or and, more, yeah. sometimes. For, yeah, it's, it's amazing. It means it's, a, uh, it's still a country of opportunity. Oh, very much, yeah. yeah. I build uh, 12 restaurants in New York. We have 35 restaurants worldwide. It would take me uh, five generations in France to create what I created in New York. It's great to have built what we have built for our industry and I think for New York. We do help each other and, and exchange, and this is why we are all here today. A very healthy competition and a true friendship at the end of the day. We call it the French connection. <laughs> it's a great picture, oh, actually. Yeah. So, we look like we were working hard in the kitchen. We don't look like so chilled out and relaxed. No, it's the quality of the picture. <laughs> are we going to do that again in 20 years? Uh, yeah, well... Maybe, uh, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs>